Um, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so first up, we have Andrew McDonald. Andrew McDonald is a Python developer who has been who has spent the last seven and a half years working at the Bureau of Meteorology. The last five years of which has been in the extended hydrological prediction section, working on a variety of water information products. Please welcome Andrew and his talk, Automated Deployment of Python Packages for Development. Hi. So, as you've just heard, my name's Andrew McDonald. I uh, work at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, can I get a show of hands? Who knows what the Bureau of Meteorology is? Who's heard of the Bureau of Meteorology? Good. <laughs> it's kind of expecting everyone's hands to go up there. Just in case, is there anyone who hasn't heard of the Bureau of Meteorology? Excellent. That's what I was expecting. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the processes that the extended hydrological prediction section of the Bureau of Meteorology use for the automated deployment of Python packages. Uh, this includes our development processes that lead up to the deployment of the packages, how we get them built and out for use. Uh, just about my colleagues that are listed up there. Uh, Kevin presented uh, yesterday on CFFI and Jupyter Hub, if you caught that session. Uh, Dae Hyok is presenting next session on Python for water forecasting. And uh, that's in a different room if you want to catch that talk. And David Kent is around at the conference, but he's not presenting anything this year. Uh, so as you just heard, um, I'm a member of the extended hydrological prediction section. Uh, it was seven and a half years when I wrote um, that uh, profile. But it'll actually be eight years in October, which like October, two months from today. Uh, so it's been a long time, but it's enough about me. Extended hydrological prediction. We develop a few water information products, and I've included the acronym EHP up there, uh, not because it's important for you to know, but because it does show up in a few snippets later. So if you're wondering what it stands for, that's EHP. Few products in particular that we produce are the seasonal stream flow forecasts for predictions on how much water will flow past a point in the river over the next three months, the seven day stream flow forecasts for predictions on how much water will flow past a point in the river over the next seven days, and uh, the hydrologic reference stations, a quality check data set of daily stream flow data with various data visualizations and some trend analysis. All these products can be found on the Bureau's website, linked from the bomb.gov.au slash water page. The diagram on the far right is, how, is lifted straight from our documentation. Um, it's the process I'm going to be talking about today, uh, but don't worry about reading it up there. I've got some large versions later. So the interesting thing for this crowd is that all these products are backed by Python software. Uh, those charts you can see, uh, for example, are built using matplotlib. So how do we go from Python code to products on the Bureau's production website? At its simplest, the development life cycle is write some code, push it into production, repeat. That isn't really best practice though. It can work for a while, but it's not necessarily the best way to get robust and useful code. For example, first service produced by the extended hydrological prediction section was the seasonal stream flow forecasting service. During initial development of the seasonal stream flow service, the steps between writing code and deploying to production weren't particularly well defined, which worked well for a rapid iteration and getting experimental forecasts out to a select few registered users. Over time, however, our development practices have evolved, adopting more standards to help us get results quickly and reliably. Doing this was an absolute must as the scope of our services grew and the number of services we offered increased. So today I'm going to be talking about our version of step one, write code, step two, question mark, question mark, question mark, step three, profit, or in this case, production, and how automating the build and deployment of Python packages eases that process. Since the early days of a single experimental service, we've introduced code review. Introducing this into our process allowed for code to be reviewed and iterated on before release. We first introduced code review when we were working on the hydrological reference stations project. At the time, we had a contractor working with us, so putting a code review system in place helped with setting direction of their development 
and monitoring changes that were made to the code base. It also meant seeing the contractor's commit messages that included Velociraptor ASCII art before they went into production. Having code reviews allows us to keep an eye on things like making sure doc strings are included and that there are unit tests covering the change. Now, if we're ensuring that unit tests are included for the code, the obvious thing to do is automatically run them before reviewing the change. So we set things up to automatically run the test suite for the code being reviewed, so as to provide feedback during the approval process. Now, just because code's been reviewed by developers doesn't mean it's ready to go into production yet. It really needs to go through user acceptance testing and possibly be revised before going into production, which means readily putting the software into the hands of the users as quickly as possible so that they can try it out and check it produces the required results. So now we have a process which can be broken down to two parts, software development and review, and deployment for testing and production use. Let's talk about this first part first, our development process. All our code is organized into Python packages. Some of our packages are shared across projects, while other packages represent an application used for specific tasks, like generating seasonal streamflow forecasts. Each Python package has its own Git repository. As I mentioned before, the flowchart on the right is lifted straight from our documentation. <coughs> Starting with developing code, a bug fix or a feature is implemented. This includes writing or updating unit tests where appropriate. Once the change is made, it is committed and pushed to the code review system we're using, which is Garrett. I'll talk more about Garrett shortly. From there, the change is reviewed. Because we're a small team, sometimes we'll do self-reviews because of the practicality of others not having time to do code reviews. Reviewing your own code is still better than no code review because you look at it later in a different context, pick things up that you didn't notice while writing it initially. I personally have looked over code that I've written and realized that I've made a mistake or missed something, like a missing or incomplete doc string, That's something I do far more often than I should. Garrett gives us the opportunity to amend those commits before approval. Of course, for bigger or more controversial changes, we'll make sure that someone else has a look over the changes before approving, because with great power comes great responsibility. We also have Jenkins, a continuous integration tool set up to automatically run unit tests when the change is submitted to Garrett. Jenkins will then give a plus one or minus one verified vote for passing or failing tests. If the tests pass and the reviewer is happy, the commit is then approved and appears in the Git repository proper. Otherwise, development can continue revising and amending the commit or extending with uh, further commits. So what is Garrett? Garrett is an Apache 2 uh, licensed code review system. It's based around Git and written in Java. Not that their choice of language matters once it's deployed. It was initially developed by Google for use with Android open source project. Fun fact, Garrett was, began life as a fork of Rietveld, which is a Python based code review system for use with Subversion, and Rietveld was written by Guido Van Rossum. We have an internal deployment, which is configured to replicate approved changes to a few different internal Git servers. Garrett has a variety of plugins that can be configured in many ways, replication being just one. We also have it configured to turn references to issue numbers and commit messages into links to our issue tracking system, or if the issue is referenced in a different format, it links to CSIRO's issue tracking system. To use Garrett effectively, you do need to be comfortable with Git. There's lots and lots of rewriting history. Garrett uses a change ID and commit messages to track logical changes, since the commit hash changes whenever the commit is amended. While the change ID can be generated from Garrett and manually pasted into each commit, that would very quickly get tedious. So a commit hook is provided by Garrett, which can be added to your repository to give each new commit a change ID automatically, while keeping any existing change ID in the commit when it's amended. By default, the code review system is managed with two labels, code review and verified, where code review is looks good to me or I'd prefer not to include this type responses and verified on the other hand can be used for stating if the code works or doesn't work. 
Minus two code review, or a minus one verified, will block a commit from being approved, while approval requires a plus two code review and a plus one verified. Anything less and a change can't be merged. Multiple people can review a change, but plus one code reviews don't stack. If multiple people voted plus one code review, it would still require a plus two from one person to enable approval. Permissions can be managed for each project so that only members of specific groups can give plus or minus two, while others can generally only vote plus or minus one. As mentioned previously, we're using Jenkins for automatically running the tests, and it's set up to run for various Garrett projects that we have. Jenkins will then give a minus one or a plus one verified based on the success of the job. Not that I expect you to be able to read the screenshot on the right, but as an example, uh, it was taken of a change that was submitted to Garrett for our documentation, which also goes through the code review process. Our documentation is written in Sphinx and built by Jenkins, and upon completion, Jenkins includes a link in the comment it leaves when voting on the change, so that you can link straight to the documentation from Garrett and have a review um, of the Jenkins build before approving. Using the same process for our documentation as writing software means that new team members um, can learn about a documentation process um, by contributing and just kind of helps embed the idea of code review. Now for some more about Jenkins. As I mentioned, Jenkins is a continuous integration server. Like Garrett, it's also written in Java. It's open source, licensed under the MIT license. It has a plugin for connecting to Garrett, which makes things easy for integrating the automatic running of tests with code reviews. We have a Jenkins Garrett job for most of the Python packages that we run through Garrett. The individual jobs allow Jenkins to track the test coverage and success over time. Most of these jobs, however, call the same shell script, which first checks if the git checkout is being run has a setup.py file, and if it does, it loads the Python Anaconda environment. Before running Python setup.py nose tests, Ned Batchelder's coverage tool, and PyLint. Screenshot there is of our Jenkins instance showing our Python build project. This Python build project is a parameterized build. It's triggered by a repository watch job. The repository watch job watches the Garrett for any approved or tagged commits and triggers the Python build project with the name of the repository and the branch or tag that was approved. Now we're getting to the core of what this presentation is about. We've discussed the top half of this process, which is developing code and approving changes. But this second part is the important bit, because if the code isn't deployed, it can't get used. So how do we get the changes into the hands of users for testing or production use as quickly and as easily as possible? This is where the Jenkins build comes in. The Python build job we've triggered is on every Garrett approved commit and every push tag. Jenkins checks out the branch or tag for a Git repository based on the parameters of the build, build parameters being a commit reference, so a branch or a tag, and the Git repository name. Job runs the shell script, which in turn calls two other shell scripts. The first child shell script is for standard PyPy style packages, the second is for Conda packages. Parent shell script covers common steps for both child scripts and exports environment variables for the children to use before calling them. The first step in the parent script is checking for a setup.py file, as I mentioned before, and stopping if one isn't found. This is because the job triggers for all of our Git repositories, some of which aren't Python packages. For example, our shared documentation, which I mentioned earlier, being Sphinx, not a Python package. If it is a Python package, the name is determined using Python setup.py dash dash name. This is because the name of the package may not match the name of the Git repository which does happen usually for historical reasons, like a package name change to make it more Pythonic. We then get the safe package name, which is the package file name as would be understood by PyPy or pip. We also get the version of the package using Python setup.py dash dash version, which is using version here behind the scenes to get the version from a git tag. Within the PyPy build script, we call python setup.py sdist, 
and Python setup.py be this wheel to get uh, source and wheel uh, packages, which we can then copy to our internal PyPy repository. Our internal PyPy repository consists of a basic directory structure that pip understands, expo exposed via Apache, so nothing too fancy. There are a few extra steps in the script that PyPy packages takes based on the git tag, but I'll discuss that a little later. We've also recently begun building Conda packages for some of our Python projects. In addition to requiring the setup.py, the script checks for a conda.recipe directory, and if it finds one, it runs the conda build command listed up there. Dollar channels is a variable defining our internal mirror of the conda channel and our internal conda channel of internal packages. The remaining three steps are about copying the conda package to the repo and building the conda index. Again, there are additional decisions made around git tags, which I'll discuss a little later. So over time, our development of Python packages has kind of converged on a similar pattern. So I've abstracted that into a template package. Since these Jenkins jobs are hooked to Garrett, it makes it simpler if all of our packages follow the same pattern. So we have a command line tool that creates a setup.py file that has the key details filled out, along with other common files for our style of Python package. The template setup.py file includes version here and the appropriate setup.cfg file to manage the versions based on git tags straight out of the gate. In addition, it includes dot, a .gitignore file to ignore common patterns like PYC files and vim swap files. We also include a dot coverage RC file so that the package is configured for generating code coverage information right away. And finally, a readme.rst with basic setup.py install instructions and it's just sitting there all ready to be filled out with further details about the package. We don't have a template conda.recipe directory yet because we've only started doing the conda stuff um, packaging recently, <coughs> but it will likely become a part of a future version of our template. So we've discussed the first part of this process, which is largely about the development of code and the tools we have supporting that. But what about those Jenkins jobs that I mentioned regarding git tags and what happens once the change is deployed or approved? Well, after the change is approved, the process follows the flowchart on the right. Any approved change will be built by Jenkins and deployed to our internal development PyPy server. So it is available immediately for pip installing in addition to deployment to the dev PyPy server, the package is automatically pip installed into our dev conda environment on our development server. This gives our developers and really keen users virtually instant access to the latest development version of any package we're working on. There is also a manual deployment of our dev test and production environments to other servers using Ansible, which we just run as needed. Now for release versions, we tag the Git repository for the appropriate commit with a PEP440 compliant tag. If you haven't read PEP440, it describes a scheme for identifying versions of Python software distributions, declaring dependencies on particular versions, and I highly recommend reading it if you have anything to do with versioning whatsoever. Once a tag is pushed to Garrett, Jenkins will automatically build and deploy to our test PyPy server as well as automatically installing into the test conda environment on our development server. Release candidates are tagged with RC tags so that they can be automatically deployed, but identifiable is not necessarily production ready yet. <coughs> After user acceptance testing, a final non-RC tag can be applied to the same commit, which will result in the test environment being updated again with the same version that's going to go into production. As I mentioned earlier, we're using version ear to handle the version numbers. Versioneer extracts the latest tag from git and uses that in setup.py and exposes the dunder version in the package. If there have been commits since the last tag, versioneer will build a version string that includes the number of commits since the last tag version and a snippet of the commit hash for the current commit. It does all that in a PEP440 compliant manner since version 0.14 of versioneer. Finally, after tagging for production, the package built with the production version can, uh, with the production version tag, can be manually copied 
from the test PyPy instance to the production one. We do this because we don't want to accidentally push changes into production. So I've been mentioning throughout that we've been using Anaconda environments. Earlier this year, we switched from doing deployments using virtual environments, so um, virtual env, and having a virtual environment per system or application. Having a unified virtual environment with all of extended hydrological prediction systems packages in it is great. Um, they're all available at once, so any of our hydrologists can sort of mix and match stuff that we have going on. The result of this um, unified environment does mean that updating dependencies, whether they be external or internal, is more easily managed. By first making them available in dev to work out any kinks, and then promoting the entire dev environment to test before a final promotion from test production. Anaconda makes this process easier through the use of environment YAML configurations to define a collection of packages and their versions. The dev environment is mostly just a list of packages, with the latest version being picked up from our dev PyPy instance or mirror. While, the tests production, while our test and production environments have specific versions specified for every package to ensure a, a working combination. The other key benefit of Anaconda is pre-built packages, which means no more waiting on NumPy or SciPy to build. And it just makes setting up multiple virtual environments for development a whole lot easier. Pre-built binaries also helps with deployment of packages that include Fortran code. So we have some research stuff where the core is Fortran, needs to be compiled with the Intel Fortran compiler. Our build process runs on the server where the compiler is available. And then we can install to other servers without issue and without needing additional compiler licenses. So it's much better than pip installing from source. We also use Miniconda rather than the full Anaconda installer to simplify the deployment. Um, it's not a big difference either way, but it does minimize the number of default installed packages. Now, while we have used Garrett and Jenkins and an internal Apache-based PyPy server, there isn't any reason these concepts couldn't be applied to other tools. In fact, as of last night, one of my personal GitHub projects now uses Travis CI to build and deploy a Conda package to the Anaconda cloud. Um, I haven't yet had the time to fully work out setting labels to market as dev for dev builds and test for test builds, but hopefully I'll get there eventually. It's all about finding time, right? And that's about it, really. That's our development life cycle, the integration of code review, continuous integration and development into Conda environments for development, testing, and production. Thank you. Any questions? Um, okay, thank you, Andrew, for your wonderful speech. Um, anybody have any questions? Anyone? No? Okay. Well, then, uh, just one more thing, Andrew. Um, on behalf of PyCon Australia, I would like to present you a small gift, just this mug. Thank you. So, one more round of applause for Andrew. Okay. Um, we still have about 20 minutes left, so uh, if anybody has questions at all, yeah? So the deployment lifecycle, that, uh, like that sounds really good. Um, how was it difficult to get it used across BOM, or is it used across BOM, or just in area? Um, it's purely within extended hydrological prediction. Um, it's not something going on um, across the wider bureau. Uh, we are hoping to try and export these ideas um, to other areas. Um, and hopefully this PyCon presentation will help with disseminating that information and um, getting other people on board. Okay. And so in BOM, like what channels are there to, to try and get things unified across the board? Uh, uh, I'm wondering if that laughter came from bureau people. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think it's a general problem. Um, yeah, so we... Um, within extended hydrological prediction, we do find it a little tricky because we are 
um, IT stuff embedded within um, the section doing um, science type work. There is um, a central IT group. Um, communication with them can be a bit challenging at times um, just because organisational structure makes it a bit difficult. Um, we do try and maintain relationships with them um, and we are hoping to try and improve on that in the future and it, it's definitely something that the Bureau recognises is a challenge and um, I'm aware that um, that IT division has undergone a lot of change recently to try and help um, improve that situation. Cool, thanks. Uh, yep, anyone at the back? Um, I was just curious as to what you're using to do your PyPI mirroring and internal package hosting. Um, so the, it's really just we download the file th uh, that we need for a particular version from PyPy and just stick it in a directory structure on the server that exposes it with Apache. Um, there's nothing too fancy in there. Um, usually comes down to we decide we need a newer version of a package um, and the developers we can all just pip install um, from the internet so we can grab whatever version we need and then we once we've done some development with that and we say oh yeah okay we we really want um, this package or this version of this package then just copy it to the server um, so there's there's nothing particularly magic in there um, but it works Okay, any more questions? Yep. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, how long did it take you to you and your team to implement or adopt all this uh, cycle? And the second question is <laughs> if you think it scales uh, down actually to have all these components like code review and uh, continuous integration. In particular is because in science when we write code, well, we have like one developer, and, which is at the same time the user of the software. <laughs> yep. So it's very nice to have all this cycle uh, for reliability of your code, but um, sometimes it's very time consuming. So. Yeah, um, both good questions. Um, so the evolution of the current state of things, um, it's been a number of years. Um, so I said we first started using Garrett with the Hydrologic Reference Stations project, um, which first went public in December of 2012. So uh, we're probably using that um, mid-2012 mid or something was when we first started using Garrett for code, code review. So it's been sort of four years now um, that we've been using it. Um, and one, like we started with Garrett and like I said, we sort of went, well, we've got Garrett, so let's hook Jenkins up to it. Um, I think we'd been using Jenkins prior to that, but we didn't have um, <coughs> sort of a ready connection between um, getting the two things um, running. Um, as for your second question of um, for smaller teams and things. Uh, there are only really four developers in our section, um, or three developers, uh, depending how you look at people's roles. Um, and um, we often end up just working on our own thing. Like I said, we do self-code reviews um, a lot of the time. Um, we do try and cast an eye over other, um, each other's code, um, but we have enough work going on that um, while we would like to be contributing to each other's projects and things, we do end up spending a lot of time um, just working on uh, our, our own thing and reviewing our own code and it, it works for us. Okay, uh, anybody else? Yep, I'll go right to the back first. Hey, I've got a couple of questions. One, I noticed in your project template, you don't include a tox any file. So I'd like to ask, understand why you didn't include that. Uh, and a second question is, how do you handle the situation where one of your applications 
sorry, I'll take a step back. You're manually pulling stuff from PyPy as you think it's appropriate. How do you handle situations where an application doesn't work well with a new version? Do you forcefully bring that application up to date or do you handle multiple versions of a requirement? Um, in terms of multiple versions of the requirements, um, we, we are aiming towards just getting everything up to date. Um, the big one that we're finding is pandas. Um, I don't know how many people have been using pandas, but um, you'll find that uh, between versions, there's often breaking changes. Um, and yeah, we, the amount of packages we're supporting has increased in recent years, uh, but for the most part, we, ju we have just aimed to um, push for including um, changes to all of our packages to work with the latest version of everything. Um, having said that, we've only really been doing this style for a year. Um, we haven't had any major problems with it so far, uh, but we might find issues down the track. As for Tox, um, I personally have looked into it a bit, but didn't quite get my head around it well enough to make a decision about using it. Um, it's, it's something that I look at every now and then and think, yeah, I, I should um, get into that a bit more. But it's yeah, just something we haven't investigated fully, and that's why it hasn't gone into um, how we're doing things. Hi, Andrew. Um, sorry if you've already answered this and I wasn't paying enough attention. Um, just wondering if there's any automated um, PEP8 sort of check or code quality check that you could, that you aren't, if you aren't already using it, um, could be plugged in so that you can say that as like a first step for a code review that you get some indication of this needs more documentation or, uh, yeah, the, you know, functions aren't named according to a standard. Um, yeah, so it was a very, very brief section on one of the slides. Um, PyLint is what we've been using. Uh, we get PyLink coverage, so um, whenever the unit tests get run, we run um, PyLint as well. That gives us an indication on uh, whether we've got violations or not. Uh, we have had Jenkins set up at times to um, vote minus one if PyLint violations get worse rather than better. Um, but we do have a lot of legacy code and that got a little bit onerous to deal with. Um, so we, we do have the pie linting there, um, but we're perhaps not adhering to it quite as well as we should um, just because of legacy code. Okay, uh, any more? Nope. Okay, thank you, Andrew. That's it.